and Sora broke down the barriers with his spear, and fear seized all men when they saw his strong form and the majesty of his manners. Then Sorab spoke, and his voice of thunder was heard even to the far ends of the camp, and he spoke words of pride, and called forth the Shah to do battle with him, and he swore with a loud voice that the blood of Zenda would be avenged. When Sorab's voice had rung throughout the camp, confusion spread within its borders, and none of those who stood about the throne would accept his challenge, and with one accord they said that Rastam was their only hope and that his sword alone could cause the sun to weep. And Tus hurried to the courts of Rastam. And Rastam said, The hardest tasks does Kaikous ever lay upon me. But the nobles would not suffer him to linger, neither to waste time and words. And they buckled upon him his armor, and they threw his leopard skin about him. And they saddled Rach and made ready the hero for strife. And they pushed him forth and called after him, Hurry, for no common combat awaits you. Surely Ariman stands before us. When Rastam came before Sorab and saw the youth, brave and strong, he said, Let us leave here and step away from the lines of the armies, for there was a zone between two camps that none might pass. And Sorab consented to the demand of Rastam, and they stepped out onto it and made ready for single combat. But when Sorab would have fallen upon him, the soul of Rastam melted with compassion, and he desired to save a boy so fair and valiant. He said to him, O oh, young man, the air is warm and soft, but the earth is cold. I have pity on you, and would not take from you the boon of life. Yet if we combat together, surely you will fall by my hands, for none have withstood my power, neither men nor deus, nor dragons. Desist from this enterprise, and quit the ranks of Turan. Iran needs heroes like you. While Rastam spoke, the heart of Sorab went out to him, and he looked at him wistfully and said, O oh, hero, I am about to ask you a question, and I entreat you that you reply to me according to the truth. Tell me your name, that my heart may rejoice in your words, for it seems to me that you are none other than Rastam, the son of Zal, the son of Sam, the son of Nariman. But Rastam replied, You're wrong. I am not Rastam. Neither am I sprung from the race of Nariman. Rastam is a Pahliva, but I am a slave and own neither crown nor throne. Rastam said this so that Sorab might be afraid when he saw his strength and think that there is yet a greater might hidden in the camp of his enemy. But Sorab heard these words and was saddened. His high hopes were shattered, and the day that had looked so bright was made dark to his eyes. Then he made ready for combat, and they fought until their spears shivered, and their swords hacked like saws. And when all their weapons were bent, they took to clubs, and they waged war with these until they were broken. Then they strove until their mail was torn and their horses spent with exhaustion. And even when they could not desist, they wrestled one another with their hands till sweat and blood ran down from their bodies. They contended until their throats were parched and their bodies weary, and to neither was given the victory. Then they stayed a while to rest, and Rastam thought in his mind, how in all his days he had not coped with such a hero, and it seemed to him that his contest with the white dave was nothing compared to this. Now when they had rested a while, they fought again with bows and arrows, but still none could surpass the other. Then Rastam strove to hurl Sorab from his steed but to no avail, and he could shake him no more than the mountain could be moved from its seat. So they took themselves again to clubs, and Sorab aimed at Rastam with might and smote him. And Rastam reeled beneath the stroke and bit his lips in agony. And Sorab boasted of his advantage and bade Rastam go and measure himself with his equals, for though his strength is great, he could not stand against the youth. So they went their ways, 
and Rustam fell upon the men of Turan and spread confusion far and wide among their ranks. And Sorab raged along the lines of Iran, and men and horses fell under his hands. And Rustam was sad in his soul, and he turned with sorrow into his camp. But when he saw the destruction Sorab had wrought, his anger was kindled, and he reproached the youth and challenged him to come forth again to single combat. But because the day was far spent, they resolved to rest until the morning. Then Rustam went before Kaikos and told him of this brave lad, and he prayed to Ormuz that he would give him the strength to vanquish his foe. Yet he made ready also his house, lest he fall in the fight, and commanded that a tender message be sent to Rodaba, and he sent words of comfort to Zal his father, and Sorab too in his camp lauded the might of Rastam, and said how the battle had been sore, and how his mind had misgiven him of the issue. And he spoke to Homan, saying, My mind is filled with thoughts of this aged man, my adversary, for it would seem to me that his stature is like mine, and that I see about him the tokens that my mother told me of. And my heart goes towards him, and I wonder if it be to stam my father, for it behooves me not to combat him. Therefore I beg you, tell me how this may be. But Homan answered and said, I have often looked upon the face of Rastam in battle, and my eyes have witnessed his deeds of valor. But this man in no way resembles him, nor does he wield the club the same way. In vileness Homan said these things, because Afrasiab had joined him to lead Sorab into destruction, and Sorab held his peace, but was not wholly satisfied. When the day had begun to lighten the sky and clear away the shadows, Rastam and Sorab strode forth to the midway spot that had stretched between the armies. And Sorab held in his hands a mighty club, and the garb of battle was upon him. But his mouth was full of smiles, and he said of Rastam how he had rested, and he said, Why have you prepared your heart for battle? Cast from you, I beg, this mace and sword of vengeance, and remove your armor and let us sit in friendship, and let wine soften our angry deeds. For it seems to me that this conflict is impure, and if you will listen to my desires, my heart will speak to you of love, and I will make the tears of shame spring into your eyes. And for this cause I ask you yet again, tell me your name. Neither hide it any longer, for I behold that you are of a noble race, and that it would seem to me that you are Rastam, the Chosen One, the Lord of Zobolistan, the son of Zal, the son of Psalm, the hero. But Rastam answered, O hero of tender age, we have not come forth to parley, but to combat, and my ears are sealed against your words of lure. I am an old man, and you are young, but we are girded for battle, and the master of the world will decide between us. And Sorab said, O man of many years, will you not listen to the counsel of youth? I wanted to spare you, that your soul leave you on your bed, but you have elected to die in combat. That which is ordained must be done, therefore let us make ready for the conflict. So they made ready, and when they bound their steeds they fell upon each other, and the crash of their encounter was heard like thunder throughout the camps. And they measured their strength from the morning until the setting sun. And when the day was about to vanish, Sorab seized upon Rustam by the girdle and threw him upon the ground, and kneeled upon him, and drew his sword from his scabbard, and would have severed his head from his body. Rustam at that point knew that only trickery could save him. So he opened his mouth and said, O oh, young man, you don't know the customs of combat. It is written in the laws of honor, that he who overthrows a brave man for the first time should not destroy him, but preserve him for a second fight. Only then it is given to him to kill his adversary. And Sorab listened to Rastam's words of craft and stayed his hand and let the warrior go. And because the day had ended, he sought to fight no more. Then Human came to him and asked of the adventures of the day 
and Sorab told him how he had vanquished a tall man, and how he had granted him freedom. And Human reproached him with his folly and said, Alas, young man, you fell into a trap, for this is not the custom among the brave, and now perchance you will fall under the hands of this warrior. Sorab was embarrassed when he heard these words, but he said, For in an hour we meet again in battle, and surely he will not stand a third time against my strength. In the meantime, Rastam had gone beside a running brook to wash his limbs and prayed to God in his distress. And he begged of Ormuz to grant him such strength that the victory must be his. And Ormuz heard him and gave to him such strength that the rock whereon Rastam stood gave way under his feet because it had not the power to bear him. When the time for combat had come, Rastam turned to the meeting place and his heart was full of cares and his face full of fears. But Sorab came forth like a giant refreshed, and he ran at Rastam and cried with the voice of thunder, O oh, you who fled from battle, why have you come out once more against me? But I say to you, this time your words of guile would not save you. And Rastam, when he heard this and looked upon him, was seized with misgiving and learned to know fear. But he didn't show his fears and made ready for the fight. And he closed upon Sorab with a newfound might and shook him terribly. And though Sorab returned his attacks with vigor, the hour of his overthrow had come. For Rastam took him by the girdle and hurled him to the earth and broke his back like a reed. And he drew forth his sword to sever his body. Then Sorab knew it was the end and he gave a great sigh and writhed in his agony. And he said, That which has come about is my fault, and henceforth will my youth be a theme of derision among the people. But I sped forth not in empty glory, but went out to seek my father, for my mother had told me by what tokens I should know him. And I perished for longing after him, and now my pains have been fruitless, for it had not been given to me to look upon his face. Yet I say to you, if you should become a fish that swims in the depths of the ocean, if you should change into a star that is concealed in the farthest heaven, my father would draw you forth from your hiding place and avenge my death upon you when he learns of my fate. For my father is Rustam the Pahliva, and it will be told to him how that Sorab his son perished in the quest to find his father. When Rustam heard these words, his sword fell out of his grasp, and he was shaken with dismay. And there broke from his heart a groan of anguish, and the earth became dark before his eyes, and he sank down lifeless beside his son. But when he had opened his eyes once more, he cried to Sorab in the agony of his spirit, and he said, Do you have a token of Rastam, that I may know that you are telling the truth? For I am Rastam the unhappy, and may my name be struck from the list of men. When Sorab heard these words, his misery was boundless, and he cried, If you are indeed my father, then you have stained your sword with the blood of your son, and you did this of your own stubbornness. I tried to turn to you to love, and I asked you your name, because I thought I saw that you had the features my mother spoke of. But I appealed to your heart in vain, and now the time for meeting is gone. Yet open my armor, and regard the jewel upon my arm. For it is an onyx given to me by my father, as a token whereby he should know me. Then Durastam did as Sorab said, and he opened his mail and saw the onyx, and upon seeing it he tore off his clothes in distress, and he covered his head with ash, and the tears of his penitence ran down from his eyes, and he roared aloud in his sorrow. But Sorab said, It is in vain, there is no remedy. Don't cry, for it was written that this should be. Now when the sun had set, and Rustam didn't return to the camp, the nobles of Iran were afraid, and they went forth to seek him. And when they had traveled but a little way, they came upon Raksh, and when they saw that he was alone, they raised a wailing, because they thought that Rustam was killed, and they went and told Kaikous what they saw. And he said, let Tus go forth and see if this indeed be so. And if Rastam is truly fallen, let the drums call men to battle that we may avenge him upon this Turk. Now Sorab, 
when he saw from afar that the men had come out to see the stem, turned to his father and said, I ask that you do me an act of love. Let the Shah not fall upon the men of Tehran, for they came forth not in hatred to him, but to do my desire. And on my head alone rests this expedition. Therefore I do not want them to die when I cannot defend them. As for me, I came like the thunder, and I vanish like the wind. But maybe it is given to us to meet again above. Then Rastam promised to do the desires of Sorab, and he went before the men of Iran. And when they saw him alive, they set up a great shout. But when they saw that his clothes were torn, and that he bare about him the marks of sorrow, they asked him what happened. He told them how he had caused a noble son to perish, and they grieved for him and joined in his sorrow. Then he bade one among them to go into the camp of Turan and deliver this message to Haman. The sword of vengeance must slumber in the scabbard. You are now the leader of the host. Return to wherever you came from and depart across the river quickly. As for me, I will fight no more, yet neither will I speak to you again. For you hid from my son the tokens of his father. Your iniquity led him to this pit. Then Rastam turned again to his son, and the nobles went with him, and they beheld Sorab, and heard his groans of pain. And Rastam, when he saw the agony of the boy, was beside himself, and would have made an end of his own life, but the nobles suffered it not, and stayed his hand. Then Rastam remembered that Kaikous had a bomb mighty to heal, and he prayed Gudaris to go before the Shah to bear a message from Rastam his servant. And he said, O Shah, if ever I have done good in your sight, if ever my hand had been of avail to you, recall now my benefits in this hour of my need, and have pity upon my distress. Send me, I beg you, the bomb that is among your treasures, that my son may be healed by your grace. And Godar sped to bear the message to the Shah, but the heart of Kaikous was hardened, and he remembered not the benefits he had received from Rustam, and he recalled only the proud words that he had spoken before him, and he was afraid lest the might of Sorab be joined to that of his father, and that they together prove mightier than he, and turn upon him. So he shut his ear to the cry of his Peliva, and Godar bore back the answer of the Shah, and he said, the heart of Kaikous is hard and unyielding, and his evil nature is like a bitter gourd that never ceases to bear fruit. Yet I counsel you, go before him yourself and see if maybe you can soften his heart. And Rastam in his grief did as Godars counseled, and turned to go before the Shah. But before he reached the Shah, a messenger came to him and said that Sorab had departed from the world. And Rastam let out a cry such that the world had not heard, and he heaped reproaches upon him, and he could not cease from complaining that the sun had fallen by his hands. And he cried and said, I that am old have killed my son. I that am strong have uprooted this mighty boy. I have torn the heart of my child. I have laid low the head of a peliva. And he made a great fire and flung into it hit the tent of many colors, and the trappings of room, his saddle, his leopard skin, his armor, well tried in battle, and all the jewels of his throne. And he stood by and looked on to see his pride laid in a the dust. Then he commanded that Sorab be covered in rich brocades of gold worthy of his body. And when they had enfolded him, and Rastam learned that the Turanians had quitted the borders, he made ready his army to return to Zobolistan. The nobles marched before the casket, and the drums of war elephants were shattered, the cymbals broken, and the tails of the horses were shorn to the root, and all the signs of mourning were abroad. Now Zal, when he saw the host returning thus in sorrow, wondered what happened, for he saw Rastam at their head and knew that the wailing was not for his son. And he came before Rastam and questioned him. And Rastam led him to the casket and showed him the youth that was like in feature and in might to Psalm the son of Nariman. And he told him everything that had happened and how this was his son who in years was an infant but a hero in battle. And Rudabatu came out to see the child 
and she lamented with them. Then they built a tomb for Sorab, and her stam laid him therein in a chamber of gold, perfumed with ambergris, and he covered him with brocades of gold. And when it was done, the house of Rustam became like a tomb, and its courts were filled with the voice of sorrow, and no joy would enter into the heart of Rustam, and it was long before he held his head high. Meantime the news spread to Turan, and there too did all men grieve and weep for the child that has fallen in his bloom. And the king of Samangan grieved, but when his daughter Tamina learned it, she was beside herself with affliction. And Tambina cried after her son, and bewailed the evil fate that had befallen him. Then she caused the garments of Sorab to be brought to her, and his throne and his steed. And she regarded them, and stroked the steed and poured tears upon his hooves. And she cherished the robes as though they had yet contained her boy. And she pressed the head of the palfrey to her breast, and she kissed the helmet that Sorab had worn. Then with his sword she cut off the tail of his steed and set fire to the house of Sorab, and she gave his gold and jewels to the poor. And when a year had thus rolled over her bitterness, the breath departed from her body, and her spirit went forth after Sorab her son.